Hello. In this video sequence, we're going to introduce fluid flow. We're going to do it specifically through the introduction of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is a general fluid dynamics equation um, that describes flow and force media as well as a number of other applications. And then we'll talk about the simplification of that equation for most flow and force media applications. So without further ado, let's uh, introduce the equation. And it's shown here on the screen. It's the, as I said, it's the Navier-Stokes equation. So where does the Navier-Stokes equation come from? How is it derived originally? It's essentially conservation of momentum, or even simpler, Newton's second law of motion, F equals ma, but applied to a fluid, or applied to a sort of unit volume packet of fluid that's moving in a larger surrounding body of fluid. So let's do this F equals ma. So what's the F term? This is the force that's on the fluid. It's a pressure, or in fact, a pressure gradient. Flow goes from high to low pressure. It's driven by a pressure gradient. And the rho g term is the force due to gravity. Then what about the M term or the MA term? So here is the fluid density. So this is mass per unit volume. Okay, so we're looking per unit volume of fluid. And then dV by dt, that's such an acceleration. But there is this second term, the V dot grad V term. It's quite important. Where does that come from? Well, as the fluid moves, it goes to a new physical location where the local velocity may be different. So there is a change in velocity simply through its movement. That's what V dot Beta equals. So that's all fine. But what's this uh, term on the left? What's this mu del squared v? So that's the major new insight into the derivation of the Navier Stokes equation. Is mu is the fluid viscosity? Well, what is the fluid viscosity? Well, if we have a rigid body, we know that there's a linear relationship between stress and strain. That's essentially Hooke's law. But if we have a fluid, the strain can be infinite, that is, the deformation of a fluid can be infinite. But there is a resistance to the rate of change of strain. So in a Newtonian fluid, essentially a simple fluid, the stress is linearly related to the rate of change of strain. And what that means physically is you imagine a solid boundary. Essentially, at the solid, the fluid doesn't move. As you go away from the solid boundary, the force phase, the fluid velocity will increase. And all things being equal, the same pressure drop, the increase, how rapidly the velocity increases, will be inversely proportional to the viscosity. So that's essentially what that viscosity term there is doing. Now, I'm not going to say any more. It is, in fact, quite straightforward to derive this equation from those principles. But our real interest is in flow and force media. So we, so we want to actually to simplify this. So how do we do this? We do this through the definition of what's called Reynolds number. Now, the Reynolds number is a ratio of essentially the inertial term, the MA term here, and more specifically this V dot grad V term, to the viscous dissipation. So it's saying, how important is the fact that the fluid is accelerating through the pore space as opposed to the viscous dissipation? And what we're going to find is that actually it's the viscous dissipation that dominates. Now, the Reynolds number is defined as follows. It's rho v l, where v is a typical velocity and l is a typical length of viscosity. And sometimes people have a difficulty with this because they say, well, unless I really solve the equation and I know all the coefficients, I'm sort of uncomfortable. But we will just want an order of magnitude here, so we just need to be able to press on. So v is going to be a typical velocity, l is going to be a typical velocity. And if we just take that simplification, then this v dot grad v term is essentially two velocities and then there's a gradient and then there's a, a density. So it's a rho v squared over L. Okay, it's not exactly that, but typically things change over a length scale L and there's a velocity v. It's of that order of magnitude. Similarly, the mu del square v term is going to be mu times velocity length squared. Now the question is, okay, fine. And the ratio of those two is relatively simple to see. Um, you know, that an L is going to cancel out, the V is going to cancel out, this is how it's Reynolds number. So let's imagine water flow. The density is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Ambient conditions, the viscosity is about 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. And pause here. Please do not get tempted because you've read it from somewhere else or you bumped into a guy in the corridor or told you to use different units. Forget about center points, just don't think about it. Forget about grams per centimeter cubed stick strictly to SI or you're gonna get yourself into trouble, okay? And then it's easy. So density is a thousand, viscosity is a thousandth, okay? 
Okay, fair enough, but what about velocities and lengths? What's a typical velocity? Groundwater flows are normally about a meter a day. And not that fast when you're looking at flow underground, because remember, you're going through a very tight pore space. If we consider oil production, we may have wells that are a few hundred meters apart, maybe a kilometer apart if we drill offshore, where it's expensive to drill wells, uh, maybe 100 meters or so if we're onshore. We inject water to push the oil out. We do that for decades, maybe 30 years. So the water typically is moving about 10 meters per year, okay, a meter a month. Okay, so we're looking at a centimeter a day. So if we want to know what a day is, by the way, um, uh, 86,400 seconds maybe, but it's about 100,000, just as an order of magnitude. Okay? So typically our velocities are in fact less than that, maybe 10 centimeters, one centimeter a day. So typically about 10 to the minus six meters per second is, is a reasonable, just give us a number estimate. What's the length? Now, this is going to be a typical length, is not the length of the size of the system. It's not the length of my piece of rock. It's not the length of my aquifer. The physical length of the porous media flow is always, always, always the pore size. And as we've shown before, typical pore sizes are, you know, tens of microns, maybe, um, in most of the samples we're going to be looking at. So, say 10 to the minus 5 meters. To put those numbers in, your Reynolds number is 10 to the minus 5. Now, the point here is it's much less than one. It's much, much, much less than one. And that means that this term is negligible compared to this. And this is what distinguishes this from other examples. If we're considering airflow around an aeroplane wing or a building, typical velocity is about 10 meters per second. The length scales are about 100 meters. The fluid viscosity is very low, okay, and the density is low. But the Reynolds numbers are much, much greater than one. In fact, the viscous dissipation is small, and this term dominates. That's when you get turbulent flow. That's when you get a very complex nonlinear flow. In porous media flows, in virtually all applications, this nonlinear term is tiny. So you can ignore it. And that gives you what's called the Stokes equation after George Stokes, who first derived this equation. Um, and then you can simplify it further, because normally, if you're looking at a small region of space with boundary conditions that don't change very much, that the velocity is steady state. So we can get the steady state Stokes equation, which is shown at the bottom. And that, to a very, very good approximation, describes fluid flow within a porous medium. But we can go do a little bit better than that. We can look at the, the behavior or the implications for average behavior. If we look here at the top, the equation is that steady state Stokes equation again. Okay, so um, that's where it starts. But the problem with solving this, I mean, we can solve it, I mean, I'll show some <laughs> solutions in, in just a moment, is that there is this complex boundary condition. You've got a very complex pore space, and wherever there is solid, the fluid is immobile and then increases into the pore space. So it's quite complex to solve, and you need a realization. You need to know exactly the structure of the rocks. You can do this, say, with 3D X ray imaging, but in general, you don't know it. So let's try and get a feel what's going on with this equation. So the first thing is, let's imagine I doubled the uh, rad p minus rho g term, right? So maybe I had horizontal flow, so I ignore gravity and I just pump twice as hard. What's gonna happen to the velocities? Uh, they all double, don't they? In fact, if you just look at the equation, there's a linear relation. It's linear, so if I scale the pressure gradient by A, or the potential of rad p minus rho g term by A, then the velocity just scales by A. Similarly with viscosity, if I double the viscosity, then the velocity is half, right? So it's inverse. So the velocity is essentially inversely proportional to viscosity and proportional to this forcing term. Now, that doesn't really get us anywhere because then in between is some complex function of location x, right? Some function of position, which we don't know and is going to be controlled by the principles. So in itself, it's not terribly uh, useful as an equation but it is going to give us insight when we look at the averaging of the thousands of pores and the, the resultant behavior. Okay, well, we'll finish this segment with um, some ideas of, well, what, does, what happens when we actually solve the Navier-Stokes equation through pore space images? What does it look like? So these are images of the pore space. So we take an image, but then that acts as the boundary condition, essentially zero flow of solids. At the inlet and outlet, 
we just have a constant pressure at this level. So we allow slow flow through this complex joint. So these are two dimensional cross sections of carbonates, uh, calcites, so calcium carbonate. So chemically, they're similar to chalk. And uh, the two dimensional cross sections are three dimensional images. And then I'm going to show the three dimensional flow field. So for Indiana limestone, that's a, a quarry limestone, what you find is actually the flow is very focused. The blue is the average speed. Which you can barely see. The green is traveling about 10 times faster than normal, and the yellow bits are where you're going 100 times. So the vast majority of the pore space is essentially stagnant. Um, you don't have a color there because it's, it's less than 100 times the average speed, sorry, 100th the average speed. So most of the pore space, although it's connected, there's virtually no flow in it, and most of the flow is highly channeled. If we take samples that are more complex in terms of their apparent pore structure, quite an open pore structure like this last sample, this sample below, and Gambia, actually everything flows with the average speed. It's this nice, open, well-connected structure. You have Estiolades, another quarry limestone, actually again, that's a very highly channelized flow. The red here represents flow speeds that are a thousand times greater. Then we have two other examples where actually there is reasonably well-connected pore structures. Hetton limestone, actually showed in the previous video sequence, it's got nice big pores that are well-connected. So they're easy to study um, and they're removing virtually the average speed. But the last sample, this is a reservoir sample from the Middle East that uh, potentially could be used for CO2 storage. Okay. And unsurprisingly, it has the most complex flow chill. Flow in just a few channels that are moving more than a thousand times faster than average. And most of the pore space is stacked. The range of flow speeds even within just a little sample of rock, and it's not going to get easier as we get bigger, even within a little sample of rock, span orders and orders of magnitude. It's quite uh, astonishing. And it's not that we move at some average speed with a small variation around it. No. In some places where you have fast flow, the vast majority is not stacked. Very different um, behavior than uh, maybe what's in uh, standard textbooks. So I'm going to finish here because that. Um, ends my introduction to fluid flow. And what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the average behavior when we average the flow over many parts. Okay. Thank you very much.